Okay, Nail, we're going to start with you. You have a feeling you've been an entrepreneur and you've helped entrepreneurs. Tell us what you think is most important in scaling up youth entrepreneurship. I mean, scaling it up. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to state that um, Le Bonne Enterprise Development Agency was built out of frustration. Um, so like you're saying- Frustration? Safe, yes, You definitely. built your agency out of frustration? Yeah. Um, I'm a young entrepreneur, um, and I was struggling to connect with enterprise support organizations to get the right kind of support that is necessary for, that was necessary for me to succeed. So I, you know, when you have the grit and you have a, a great product and you have a customer base, but you're just missing that one link that can take you to the next level. And the people that are there to help didn't really understand um, what you need. So I built Le Bonne to be the bridge. Yes. So how many people in this room are from a business support organization? Some are here. And for those of you who are here, I hope you've heard she was frustrated. She was a young entrepreneur. She didn't know where to go to get what she needed. What did you need? Um, I needed the right policies to be in place. I needed the right training. Um, and I feel like the organizations didn't understand the youth needs and the entrepreneurs need. And I think uh, when you talk about scaling entrepreneurship, um, we have to use a systems thinking approach. Um, and systems thinking is really about um, how the ecosystem works together. So if one part What do you is, mean by an ecosystem? Um, the ecosystem, the entrepreneurship ecosystem is basically the government, the customers, the business support organizations, the entrepreneurs themselves. Um, and it's about working together to scale up. So if we have a great government, but the entrepreneurs are, are slacking, then the ecosystem is not working together. So um, think about it as like a car can have all the parts, but if the starter isn't working, then it's not going to go anywhere. So everything has to work together, and this is where the bridge came in. Um, so when you were talking about ecosystems, we use this word a lot, entrepreneurship ecosystems, and you said governments, businesses, chambers of commerce. I know that you've talked about universities, and you've talked about families who support you to get started. Um, Alan has spoken to us about business mentors in the community, about banking, um, about television, about social media. So think about it. That ecosystem is bigger than what you think it is. And it's all parts of society. Be creative because every country is different. That's true. Um, let me come back to you about those things. I want uh, you to tell us. India, uh, a lot of policies have been good by the Indian government, uh, starting from incubation network. They help you reach and out from the validation of the market. I'm not sure. Did, take your mic down just a little bit. Um, did Did everyone hear what you said? So they were like incubator centers in universities. Yeah. So you know, uh, in India, from the university days itself, you are nurtured in such a way that your mindset is more on a business side rather than a job side. So if you have an idea, then universities have these incubation centers. They're equity free. So you walk in there, they help you out with registration of your business skill, validation of your ideas, if marketing accepting your products or not, till investment raises and other things. So the universities were there to help you develop an idea even before you got out of school. And the advantage of that for you, for India, is that it's a system that's a little bit more widespread. And you were saying you didn't need, because he was saying in, when we were speaking beforehand, that helped for people who could just get all of those different documents, put them together, a little bit of a one-stop shop. You were saying, we don't need that, we need something else. And Alan told me before, one-stop shop, that's a thing of the past. We've got to move beyond. Is that right, Ellen? Yes. 
The narrative is changing, thinking flexibly and being agile. Let's go back to you. Agility. Um, yes, definitely. We need more agile systems, I think, um, to scale up entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is a very fast-paced um, uh, sort of job. Um, when you have an idea, you have to keep it moving. So if you don't have the right policies in place, if you don't have the right support in place, then it becomes hard to scale entrepreneurship. Um, so, and we spoke to, uh, about that with, with Alan, about changing the culture um, of support organizations and having that agility and implementing things. So having an idea and kind of moving it along um, quickly and adapting to the needs of everyone around you. But in the meantime, you were agile when you were frustrated. You created your own network. <laughs> and tell us how you connected with ITC. I hear it was in a car, <laughs> wasn't it? It was. And where were you going to? <laughs> <laughs> it was. I think uh, the agility has to be collective. So it can't just be from the entrepreneur side. Um, I, collect, I connected with ITC from my initial connection was with She Trade. Um, I was invited to the previous WEDF, um, and I got into a cab with somebody who worked at ITC, and she was telling me about the Yay community and how they have um, this global community of entrepreneurs, and they kind of tap into their insights to build programs around um, what the entrepreneurs need. And I said, we need that in Botswana, so let's build it. And that is how the Yay community was started in Botswana. Um, so the Yay community was agile enough to work with the entrepreneurs in Botswana and find out what they need and provide the training that they actually need. So we need the policymakers to be agile. And um, one of the things you've said about policymakers and business people is they need to hear young voices. They do. And, and I believe you did a pulse survey, didn't you, of young entrepreneurs. What did they tell you in that pulse survey? Um, the pulse check was basically to see um, the gaps in knowledge um, from young entrepreneurs in Botswana. And I found out that uh, they need upskilling in financial literacy. They needed assistance with uh, how to create strategy for their business, basically how to monetize their idea and what strategies they can use um, to build revenue models. Um, they needed how to they needed to learn how to assess the competition and not just kind of build businesses based on I think with young entrepreneurs you want to follow your passion so much but you don't do enough research so it was about teaching entrepreneurs how to research their competition and listen to the market and listen to the market and we got experts in the market to assist them which was really great and this is an example of how an ecosystem can work together to, and be agile um, to, to grow. So I'd like to turn to Vedant. Tell us a little bit more. Your experience was a little bit different. And what helped you the most? Yes, you know, um, our venture, we started during COVID times when the world was just right. going down. And very difficult very starting difficult. up and living through yeah. the pandemic. But for us, it was very easy because the system was already placed from last two, three years. So it was very easy for us, even virtually, to set up a company, you know, to work on your ideas and to validate in the market. And second thing, you know, uh, in India, our uh, uh, good incubation centers, they connect you with chambers of commerce and industry experts. So we are not experts in everything. We need mentors. We need business people who can help us to refine our businesses to grow further. Were you comfortable finding business mentors? Yep, yep. You it was really good for us to uh, find mentors uh, who can refine our businesses because their experiences from last 20, 30 years would help young entrepreneurs to grow their initial baby steps to walk into About a lot of things in the system around you when we talked beforehand, and you've told us about the university experience, you've told us about family supporting you. And you've also talked to us about the value of competitions, like the one we're going to have yeah. very soon. Yeah. How did having the competition help you as a young entrepreneur? 
because so, it's not just about winning yeah. even the you know, journey along the way. Young Entrepreneur Award helps a lot, help us out a lot because you know, before we were working on something else and, and the mentors from YEA help us to refine our business models that actually build the venture bill. And second thing, you know, uh, we got a sh very good spotlight in the social impact sector in India. And third, me and my co-founder has, after the YEA award, has made such a ecosystem for not about just green and sustainable business, but apart from that, you know, working with hundreds of people for green jobs, giving migrant workers jobs, and also affordable housing projects in India. So that helped, you know, the award helped us a lot, uh, like eco bricks, what we make, can be used for affordable housing, the, the people who are not having homes and, and government's vision for getting homes for everyone in India. So it helped on a variety of levels from visibility to helping your business models uh, to making connections. So it's something you would encourage to young entrepreneurs who are out there. Yeah. If they're ready, they've got to get ready first. So I'll say, you know, uh, uh, if I can do it, then why not all the entrepreneurs can do it? And keep smiling, you are changing the world. If you can do it, others can do it. Okay, uh, I'd like to turn, before we turn to Alan, uh, if my colleague Yahya, who is behind the scenes, if you could just show us a video about what Alan has done to introduce this, and then we're going to see if this really meets the needs of young entrepreneurs, what it's different, where he's going in the future. Roll it, Yahya. The Eagle's Nest Youth Export Incubator was designed to accelerate the development of youth-led businesses into export entities. Over 12 months, more than 100 youth-led SMEs were directly capacitated with export awareness, intense export marketing skills, and technical interventions. The program's success can be attributed to its unique approach. The export development journey of the participants was packaged into a reality TV show, which aired on the national TV channel, with a viewership of more than 90,000 young people per episode, raising general export awareness among thousands of youth-led SMEs. Of those that received direct interventions, 14 youth-led SMEs were export-ready in the first 12 months of the program. Six are now exporting to Ghana, New Zealand, South Africa, and Zambia. The number continues to grow. The Eagle's Nest Youth Export Incubator. So there we are. Alan, you represent... Um, one of the places that people want to turn to for help, people like the young entrepreneurs on this stage. Tell us about the Eagle's Nest example. What made you do it? Did, was it something normal that you would do in a trade promotion organization or was it a little bit disruptive? No, thank you very much. But if you can allow me to talk about Zimbabwe before I get to Eagle's sure. Nest. Uh, uh, this is my first time in Mongolia and hopefully not my last. And uh, like Mongolia, Zimbabwe is land linked, not land locked. My sister from Botswana is our border. We've got Zambia, we've got Mozambique, we've got South Africa. And like Mongolia also, we are dominated by minerals. I think 80 to 90 percent of our exports are minerals. So in Zimbabwe, we say it's easy to count the minerals we don't have than what we have. So if you're thinking of doing business in value addition of minerals, please come to Zimbabwe. And uh, two more things. Seventh wonder of the world is in Zimbabwe, Victoria. Right. Seventh wonder of the world, Seven. Victoria Falls. So the pictures you see about Victoria Falls being advertised, the view you see from Zimbabwe, uh, it's geography, I'm just saying. And um, finally, one of our best products is horticulture. So I always tell people that if you go into Europe and get into a shop and you buy blueberries, if they taste nice and organic, don't read the label, they come from Zimbabwe. So I'm inviting you to come to Zimbabwe so that you can enjoy the sweetness of what we offer in terms of horticulture. Now, what was your question again? He's a good ambassador for his country <laughs> and the bridge to yours. So do you think, tell us first of all, well, I'll tell you what I think already for starters. I was really attracted to your initiative because it's not easy to reach out to informal communities. 
And if you were saying people are not comfortable, uh, sometimes when you're young, it's not easy to go and knock on a door to talk to people who are already used to doing business in certain ways. In formal communities, it's got to be even harder. They're not in town. Yeah. They weren't in Harare. They were further out. Yeah. And you used the power of communications to make things happen and not just visibility. Mm. Because what I liked about your example is 12 episodes on TV broadcast out on national TV, and you didn't, didn't just do a shark tank. Mongolia has a shark tank. So many places have a shark tank. And what you did is you showed the training and the business mentors and the partnerships along the way, and then chopped it up and put it on social media, which is people need to get to institutes and they need training, but this is already a way to get them learning and interested in business. Now, tell me, do I have the story right? Wrong? Yes. But you left one important bit. Uh, so we had a workshop in uh, one part of the country, and there was a youth who was also frustrated, like me here. Another so I was, frustrated youth. I was, I was sitting on the podium like this with my minister, and then this young lady stood up and said, "There are old people in this room. There are no youth. What are you guys doing? Answer." And I said, "My job is gone." And the minister was there. <laughs> So the minister then said, I think we should have programs targeted at youth. So we then did an engagement rather than being prescriptive. You know, yeah. if you go to the youth and you tell them you have to do this and that, you, you lose it. So we said, let's listen to what they want. Of course, you hear a lot of crazy ideas. And what we then did is Zim Trade. We did not go to look for funding to implement it. You didn't we, go? To look for funding. For funding. Yeah. We said we want people to believe in what we're doing. So we put our own seed money into the program to kickstart it. So as we went on, a lot of people found value in it to the extent that some of the support institutions just came and sort of dumped money at us. <laughs> Alan, here's 50,000, continue doing what you're doing. So thank you very much. I, I wish ITC could do the same to you. <laughs> uh, anyway. So Alan, how did you listen to them? Where did you go? They wouldn't come knocking on your door. So we went to all the provinces in our country. All the have, provinces. Yeah, what, what we call devolution. And our president has got this mantra, leaving no place and no one behind. So if you want to be heard by the government, you have to go devolution. All corners of the country. I'll give you an example. Uh, when apples were still apples before they became computers, uh, they started in a garage. So for us, we were not looking at where you were operating from, who you are, or where you're coming from. We are concentrating on the idea and how we can build the idea to become a viable business entity. You've said that too, Vedant. The idea comes first. The, and you've said that. Yeah. Yes. And also money follows an idea, not an idea following money. So not just, at Zim, not just the young entrepreneurs, but also the institutions who might be thinking of doing something like what you've done. So for all of you business organizations that are supporting businesses, Please feel free to talk to Alan afterwards and remember that the money follows a good idea. I just want to add one thing, you know, uh, for any businesses, it's just not raising funds and, you know, making the valuation of a company huge, but the company should be financial sustainable for next 10 to 15 years, what you're building. That's the main thing about any business, not just valuation game. Do you have comments? Do, you, do either of you want to ask Alan um, something? No, I'm very impressed by the agility of Zim Trade. Um, I think a lot of my initial frustration was uh, from the fact that you speak to people, you speak to a business support organization, and they can hear that the ideas are there, but they don't put it to action. So I think it's really admirable um, that something concrete came out of that. Um, and I really hope business support organizations from many other developing countries can adopt that strategy of uh, if somebody, if a young entrepreneur comes to you and they're frustrated and you can see, then you move. And that's the agility part of if an ecosystem is agile enough, then a great change can be made. We spoke about that with Vedant yesterday um, when he was telling me about the Silicon Valley of India and how it literally blossomed in the past five years. And that's just an example of a system that's agile that wouldn't have been able to happen if people didn't 
implement ideas and actually make things happen. So I think I'm always inspired by action-oriented people and I'm happy to be here with both of you. So if I can follow up, I think Mia has got something interesting to say. I think she'll say it later about the lost uh, yes. adventure. But we'll talk oh, about that later. Yes, we spoke about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for, for me, I would like to say, you spoke about culture and agility, but I would like to thank ITC. Um, you know, people always say culture, it's strategy for breakfast, but we discovered it also it's for lunch and dinner. <laughs> so ITC came through and also helped us through a performance improvement roadmap that made us to be an institution that we are today. I think they did a benchmark. All TPOs here, I would encourage you to go through the benchmarking exercise. We have a benchmarking program. Yeah. And we go to trade organizations and we assess how they're doing and then we help them go through. And I think Alan was wriggling in his seat when he had the results of the benchmarking. And I guess you said, what can we do, right? Yeah. Um, at first, we had 30%. I was noted that Zim trade for the record. So the 30%, it's a fail. It was not good. So we made effort to make sure that um, we beat Mauritius. It was 60% then. And through the assistance that we got, we got 61% and it made us one of the most best performing TPOs in Africa in terms of systems, ETC. So that then also led to where we are today in terms of giving assisting programs that are value-based and that react to the requests of our valued clients. So that worked for us uh, uh, very well. But to, to also, Neil, I think one key thing, I'll, I'll give an example of a, a road we walked. The youth that we worked with, they now concentrated on indigenous products, not the normal products that you'd see in the market. I think this topic of indigenous products is very important for all developing countries, yeah. including Mongolia. Yeah. And it's like you say, our grandparents would think something wasn't that valuable, but it is today. Yeah. I'll just give one example of one indigenous product. I think they call it baobab. I hope you know what baobab is. You know is. the baobab tree? You know the baobab tree? Mm -hmm. Cool stuff. So this youth came through and uh, made powder from the baobab. And I'll tell you the powder from the baobab is very nutritious. It has got six times the magnesium of bananas 15 times the fiber of whole wheat bread and two times the calcium of the milk in calcium calcium in milk you know you get what i'm saying very healthy yeah so you are getting this in one save and previously people did not know and now the youth have got into this business and they're exporting the powder to europe at very big prices and already it's organic we did know it's organic we tested it so we went through an organic certification process for it to be exported and the seed that remains, if you crush it, you get baobab oil used in cosmetics. And all these things are being done by youths for, for experts. So our student, Tineo, she's going to tell us about a plant or something in your desert that people are not extracting value in, and then yes. you need to extract. Yeah. Um, we spoke about um, truffles in the desert of Botswana. Um, one of the questions that you asked me, Natalie, was um, what... What keeps me up at night? Oh. Yes, I ask them what keeps them up at night. <laughs> yes, and I told her that I'm really, I worry about um, the underserved communities um, and having sort of an ecosystem that doesn't recognize the people that are far out um, in the rural areas. Um, so I worry about people being left behind and we have so much value in our indigenous products um, and not just the products, but even indigenous knowledge. Um, so um, I worry about that um, and that, you know, the value of that truffle is not benefiting um, that one Mutswana who is surrounded by it. Um, so that's just one of the things that um, I think about a lot that, well, I'm from a diamond rich country, so our main expert is diamonds. So the diamonds are bringing value, but there's so many other valuable things that can be extracted that um, are friendly to the environment, that are abundant, and that people have indigenous knowledge of extracting and even um, uh, creating value out of. So um, 
it, I think it would be beneficial. I, I like what you've done, that you had an outreach program where you actually went everywhere to find the gems because I think those are the, the kinds of products and the kinds of people that kind of can propel us forward. So there's a, there's a gem maybe in terms of a product in Botswana somewhere or in terms of a person that we don't know that can elevate entrepreneurship to such great heights and I worry about not finding them. It's interesting where well, you're talking about black truffles and baobab trees because this is a conference about green and digital mm. and Botswana is turning towards digital. I know that Mongolia is making a big effort towards turning digital, but the issue of culture is also important. And the part of this culture is within our own world, understanding what to value, what to preserve, what to market, that goes in with the whole green and digital way of the future. And that's what you all are talking about. Um, Vedant, green side, digital side, both side, where do you come in on this? You know, uh, what I would like to say, uh, for any country development for startups, they have to think from now for any developing countries to set up an ecosystem for startups in green sector from now itself to work on the you know, uh, models which other countries have started. For example, in India in 2016, there were just 450 startups registered. Now 2023, we have 90,000 plus startups. Just in the movement of five years, this happened just because of the policies what made you know, young entrepreneurs motivated towards you know, uh, putting their efforts into business world. Yeah. So policies can drive entrepreneurship. And you were mentioning that too. Yes, I did. this is what I say about let's be agile. This is what you can achieve. And I've spoken to Vedant. I really want to come to India, Vedant. Let's make it happen. Oh, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, me <laughs> too. <laughs> okay, we're, we're all going to India <laughs> from here. Um, but um, I really like the, I'd like to learn from how you've done it. Yeah, yeah so that we can all kind of, propel no, each other for forward. all the countries should learn from each other like a lighthouse project from setting up one country's you know example example for other countries to implement that in different countries how maybe us did or india did or some other country it can be replicated into countries like zimbabwe and mongolia and Botswana. did you have something on the tip of your tongue yeah it, it ran away let me look for it it came back yeah so um, I, I think one of the key challenges, I see tomorrow there's a discussion that is going to happen on financial issues. Finance, access to finance. Access to finance. And uh, I would like to also hear from Mio and Vedant on the same. But um, our experience is um, the financial institutions, um, when they see the youth coming through, they see disaster. They literally say, can't give money to, to the youth. They, they have already defaulted moment they walk into a bank before they even ask for the money. So the, the issue is we need to have tailor-made um, uh, financial packages for the youth. Uh, we were dealing with uh, one youth who was 25 years and he went to a bank and was told, can we have your 10 years financial history? So in short, they wanted to know how your company was performing when you was 15 years, <laughs> which, which, which doesn't work. It's practically impossible. So exactly. that, that's why we then focused on the idea. I hope people here are listening. Tailor-made programs for young people in terms of access to finance. Yeah. So they don't have collateral. Most of them are living in their parents' house. You know. So we then said the product that they are selling can become the collateral. So let's say um, I'm producing these things eh? and uh, I don't have collateral. So I put an order for 1 million of these things. I then go to the bank to say, I will do my transaction through you. Fund me to produce 1 million of these things, and then you get my money when I move my product through your bank for export. So it's something that can work, but of course it requires KYC to know your customer. Mm -hmm. So, but this is just me thinking I'm not a banker, and I know out there bankers have got more solutions. I know you have some products in your bag there yeah. you, is did they do that tell us the story behind those products did they use that as collateral 
when they approach the bank? What's so, going on? So this is a smaller version of a big thing that I could have carried, but you know, my bag is not a cargo bag. It was just a bag to carry my clothes. So I put this in. So this small basket was made by women in the remotest of areas called Binga in Zimbabwe, the Zambeze Valley. So it's made from a wheat that is regenerative. And uh, I think to make sure that um, Natalie does not ask me tough questions, I'm going to give you this. You can take this <laughs> off. Th thank you. Oh, thank and you and so please much. make sure you tweet thank so you. that I also keep my job back home. <laughs> we, we this. So it's, it's a basket made in the village. It's, 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 it's quite nice. If you can allow me at this moment, you know, that this is leather. One of the winners of the Eagle's Nest makes this type of leather. It's called Moreda. So this is a card holder. Um, it can help you carry millions in your card. <laughs> so when you get to India, please also tweet about this. Um, let me see if I've got something for my sister here. Oh, equally. It's a small leather purse made by the same company. Um, it's empty, but I know it can also carry millions for with a qr code for, on the you. back for you thank you yeah. so much Just thank you, case, you very much you have millions Digital out there yeah, yeah, and have yeah. an empty purse yeah just waiting for the money <laughs> <laughs> okay i'd like to take any questions at this time if ever, anyone has questions for our panelists Wow, are we a quiet room here? Because if we are, okay, I see a question from Raymond, who is leading our Youth in Trade program. Hello, thank you so much. My name is Raymond. I would like to hear from the young entrepreneurs, how do you support each other a bit? What are the functional peer networks that you can put in place to make that ecosystem agile and be adaptable to new market needs. How you're supporting each other. Um, I'm so glad you asked that question because I believe so much in peer mentorship. I think there's value in having mentors for people that have made it, that have built successful businesses, but sometimes that advice and mentorship can get lost in translation because they don't understand some of the challenges that we face as young entrepreneurs. For example, if you've started a business maybe in the 80s, the landscape is different. So the advice that you would give to somebody who started um, a business during COVID, for example, would be sometimes a bit outdated. Um, but I think it's valuable to have a network of young entrepreneurs that can tap into each other's knowledge, because I think we often underestimate the value of the knowledge that we have, um, but we can actually mentor each other and help each other grow. So I think that can be an active role that young entrepreneurs take um, in assisting each other grow. Right, having the right space and being comfortable. What about yes. you, mentors? You know, uh, mentorship uh, from entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs and then towards you know experienced business people. So I was just talking with one of the finalists yesterday, you know, what challenges they are facing in early stage of production. So what, how we came out from, how we overcome from our production units, maybe digitalization of more machineries, how you can, you know, uh, uh, make more efficiency in the, in your businesses. So you, you definitely need mentorship and mentorship always comes with an experience of a venture. Mm -hmm. Ellen, what are you doing in terms of mentorship? They're talking about mentorship, um, maybe people who are experienced, but also among themselves. Thank you. If you noticed on the video, what we did for the Shark Tank, we took youths that have made it, that have done business, so that they could connect as mentors to the guys that were coming in. If they took someone as old as me and put them on the panel, they'll say, hey, the old guy's back here again, trying to be prescriptive. Mm -hmm. But they engaged with the youths, and it really helped them. And they felt comfortable, and they told each other the truth. What about the space? Does it matter in a digital age to have a comfortable space, a physical space? I think or is it, it a cafe? <laughs> what does it, it mean? I think it depends on, on the industry. Um, 
but a lot of a lot of business can be conducted online and even things like the registrations can be done online and the networking can be done online um, and I wanted to circle back uh, to the question I think we can assist each other by um, helping each other add value um, to our businesses for example um, if I'm if I'm making a leather product um, and maybe Vedant is in the tech industry, he can come and do a business analysis for me and tell me how I can um, sort of use um, the digital tools that are available to make my operations more efficient. So we can help each other create value in that way. Um, and we can, yeah, that's how we can help each other. Clusters of businesses, yeah. allied businesses, exactly. cousin businesses. Yes, so that, that, exactly. This is one thing what we have in our incubation centers in India. No, it's not It's not just co-working spaces, but we have co-working labs for very early stage startups who works together, like there are 50 startups, youth spaces, maybe someone is in digitalization, someone is into some other products. So you help each other, you talk with each other, you brainstorm with each other. The, the new ideas come from there. When you work together, you know, co-working spaces and labs. I've heard all sorts of things because there were there were there was talk among the IT companies and you saw these really cool working spaces and then came the pandemic and we were all isolated and the digital things went way up but now that's passed and people actually want to be together again don't they like here <laughs> that's true so that's why I was asking where do you meet how do you meet what's the best way what do you think Alex? I think everything is the best way. <laughs> everything. No no particular formula for anything because it's like what depends on the on the industry on what what you're doing. And like what I said, Apple, before it became a computer, it was in a garage. Now it's a computer, it's out of the garage. So you can move from a home or a backyard into a more formal setting, depending on how you follow your idea. So a lot of it is about character too, isn't it? Definitely. Yep. Questions? Oh, I'm seeing the hands. And Mateo's going to come and take your questions. So please uh, say where you're coming from. Geography. And please, not too long. We need Skylar. It will be faster. We have the... But I think it. Thank you. We multitask at ITC. Thanks, Skylar. Thanks very much. Uh, very, very happy to have this opportunity to ask again. Very happy to have this opportunity to ask again. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, last night, I asked a question in the last conference. Uh, I, I asked and I already asked a question earlier this morning. Uh, uh, I apart from my title as the Mayfeya uh, America, African and Asia uh, a Business Association. Uh, apart from that title, he's also a uh, he's also an investor. Uh, in the past ten years, I've probably have seen more than three thousand projects. And now I am managing two funds. One uh, one of which is about biochemistry. Uh, medicine. Uh, and the fund is about um, two, uh, 0 0.2 billion uh, RMB. Uh, hard to do the math to convert to. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, in 2023, on the 23rd of June, I published the in, on, the 20th, on, the, on the 23rd of May 2020, uh, 2023, in Beijing, I launched a second fund. 
。中国。Sorry to interrupt because I saw so many hands up. 我再说一句，中国，中国农业产业，中国农业，中国农业科技创新投资基金。And this fund is about uh, innovation in uh, uh, in agriculture. 总规模一百亿人民币。And the size is one uh, is is one billion RMB. 呃，我今天的问题是。My question today is. 中国的人民币基金如何与我们世界上各国的产业基金做深度的融合和对接？ Uh, how can uh, funds from China work with international organizations such as yourself? 换句话说，人民币基金是否是有通路和机会进入到我们不同的国度，在产业上赋能 ？In other words, can a Chinese fund work together with organizations such as yourself? Can a Chinese fund work with an organization like ITC or ZimTrade or any other organization? Yes, I'm not the expert to talk about it, but let's take a couple more questions. But the answer is yes, and we will connect you. Okay, Matteo is going to the back. Hello. Uh, of course, I'll try to keep it short, but I do want to compliment ITC and the panelists on, a, on an interesting discussion. My name is Peter van Gils. I work for the Dutch Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. We have a lot of projects in agriculture, and what we come across is that youth are no longer interested in agriculture. Are there any thoughts, and I'm, I'm looking particularly at the CEO of ZimTrade, um, how greening the trade can make youth interested in agriculture again? Oh, I think that's going to come up in the pitch competition. I see some <laughs> eyebrows going up. <laughs> More questions, please. Let's take a few. I see three hands in the front. Maybe we'll take a few of the questions and then we'll let them answer. No one's interested in agriculture, connecting businesses, investors. And now? Hi, I'm Mashur from Bangladesh. I'm actually an uh, agricultural startup uh, uh, owner, so we might be catching up later. Yep. So my question is, uh, while building our startups, when we see that certain absence of policies of the government or, or the mechanism available around us is hampering our business. For example, often governments in the developing nations try to become the executor instead of remaining the regulator. So when we see this kind of lack of policy in the process that directly hampers businesses like ours, how do you suggest us to raise our voice? Because we're just a startup, right? We don't have much of backup behind us. How do you think we should be dealing that kind of things? Thank you. Enabling policies, how do we get it going? There are so many questions. We're going to just keep the questions rolling for a moment, and then we'll give you a chance to answer. Thank you. I'm Douglas Majola from South Africa. I work for a small enterprise support agency. Um, my question is directed to uh, Neo and Alan. The first one is, I just want to know, uh, are you only targeting the startup businesses or you work across the entire business life cycle? And then if you work across the entire life, the life cycle of, 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 of the business, what model do you use for intent to service different sectors and businesses with uh, different needs? Uh, because you can't offer everything in-house. So how do you leverage from Startups or more? the ecosystem? Do you prioritize sectors? Okay, I see one of the judges from the Ecopreneur competition raising her hand. Paula, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Paula Padrino from the G20 Global Land Initiative. I had two questions. One was for Vedant. I wanted to know, you spoke a lot about how in India you had a great ecosystem that surrounded you as a startup and all the positive aspects. And I wanted to know what were your challenges when building your uh, startup during COVID as well. So that's my first question. And the second one, if you had one piece of advice that you want to give to a young ecopreneur, what would it be in a very short uh, 
nutshell. Thank you. Okay. So I think we'll start with the, whoever would like to take the floor. Who wants to go first? Okay, <laughs> now it's to you. Um, which question should I start with? <laughs> um, okay, I'll start with yours. Um, you spoke about um, how, how do we make sure that the governments be, remain the policy makers and are making the right policies instead of the implementers. Um, I think we have to lobby for it. Um, and don't think of yourself as just, I'm a, I'm a small startup and I can't go up against the government. Um, for me, uh, there's been a lot of value in speaking up for myself. And I realized that some people can't speak up for themselves, which is why I'm here, to speak up for them. So for me, I would say that um, more than just speaking up for yourself, leverage institutions, organizations such as ITC, you will be surprised at how much support there is there. Um, so uh, reach out, reach out to people and don't be afraid to speak up for yourself because there's no such thing as I'm just a startup. You might be the, the next uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who knows? So, um, And I wanted to answer the gentleman who was speaking about um, youth and farming. Um, I think there is a lot of interest um, in farming from the youth, but maybe we're, we're coming at it from a different perspective. Um, I interact a lot with uh, startups in Botswana and internationally that want to innovate the farming industry because I think we are aware of um, what is about the challenges and that we can't go on as business as usual and agriculture as usual. We want to revolutionize it, um, which is what some of the startups that we'll be pitching later today are doing. So stick around, stick around. <laughs> just stick around. Innovation and value add. Yes. So just to add to um, uh, his answer, you know, I know there are a lot of you know, challenges from government side for uh, funding startups and so but apart from that, if you're sure about your product, then you should definitely go for, you know, subsidies, debt funds. That's a really nice thing. What we, I do, uh, I did with my startup because we had a lot of challenges for raising funds and we're sure about our products that it's going to work in the market. If you're sure, then you then definitely go for Asian, Asian Development Bank Ventures or, you know, angel investors who are specific into your field that can not just, you know, provide you with money, but their expertise as a strategic investor. And apart from that, you know, uh, go for some uh, debts, collateral free debts. That is a really good thing uh, in our country, what we have, collateral free debts. The government takes your responsibility, at least for one or two years. Uh, and, and the interest rates are very, very less. So as a very early stage, a uh, young entrepreneur, when you don't have you no know, uh, money coming in for paying your debts, so you also get some monitoring period for that. So once your startup is successful, at least for one year, then you can start paying your you know, debts with interest. Seed money and beyond. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll start with the Zhao Shanghao, Wo Jiao Elui. So that's the bit I know about Chinese. <laughs> the, the translator can help in translating that. Um, yes, we can work together in terms of funding, um, but the challenge that we've seen in the past with the youth that we're working with, they've got the idea, but sometimes there are people who want to put money they put money and they take majority and the idea is lost mm. and the company is closed. So I know it's not my money, but my advice is sometimes guide when you invest, but let people who know the idea and who know where they want to go drive the agenda. Not, not to too many up. strings. Mm. Yeah, yeah, not too many strings actually, yeah. So for CBI, yes, um, for us, I think the narrative has, has changed. Actually, the youth have even formed a farmer organization, a quite big and vibrant one in Zimbabwe. And the blueberries that I spoke about, most of them have been produced by the youth. Uh, the challenge was people were not seeing farming as a business. They were seeing it as a manner in which you farm, you eat, and that is it. So now it's been seen as a business, and if they can make money, they'll come through and make money. So the policies around farming have to be supportive people to generate profit and value. So here we're going back to mindset when we're talking about agriculture yeah. and why uh, 
television and social media especially could be very important. Yeah. And I can tell you in Zimbabwe. And indigenous products. Yeah, yeah. Very true. And I can, you are now talking like you work for Zimtrade. Eh? Um, and I can tell you in Zimbabwe, I think we are one of the few countries after Ethiopia who have managed to produce wheat in, that can cover us for 18 months. And the key contributors to that were also young farmers. So they are doing quite a lot in that. So, but we can have a discussion outside this to make sure how we can enhance other crops in terms of us reaching the European market. Um, I think the issue of policies, Neo tackled it very, very well. But what I can say is you need to engage government. And engagement is not an event, it's a process. So continuous engagement is quite key for, for things to move. And uh, the, the lady from the SME asked about sectors, startups, what do we do, ETC. So like what Neo said, it's an ecosystem. And for us, it's about collaboration. We don't do everything ourselves. We've managed to partner organizations in Germany, SES, PUM, in, in the Netherlands, even locally, we've put mentors that know specific sectors and that can assist our youth. So our role in some areas becomes coordinating, not necessarily being us doing everything. So yes, collaboration is, is quite key. Thank you. I just answered to Paula's question, you know, uh, yeah, so we started our company just during COVID times, you know, it was a very challenging time for four or five months, but what I feel is a good time for us because when the whole world was, you know, in the pandemic, we are sitting at our homes just researching. So at a very early stage, it was a research time. So four to five months, we converted our you know, uh, small rooms and garages into a labs, me and my co-founders. We uh, raised some funds from our families, like bootstrap, a small amount of money. And, uh, but yes, we were sure that our product will work. So what I'll suggest to all the eco panels also that uh, just survey the market that you, the product, what you are making, is it feasible for people to use? Is it a market to expand? And second thing, if it doesn't work, you should have a backup plan in your mind, at least for after one year. If, this, if not this, then what? If we want to pivot in the business, a new product, or shut it down if it doesn't work, then you should have a backup plan. Prepare to be agile. Prepare, yeah. um, I'll answer her um, question. Um, we mainly work with startups, um, but that is because they are a very underserved population. Um, and like Zimtrade, we, are, we become facilitators in some cases. Um, I like to think of Lebone as a bridge. So most of the, most of the time, our role is to connect to different um, institutions or to connect startups with various institutions that can offer them assistance. So what we do mainly is we work with startups to help them develop their ideas. We teach them a few um, principles and business modeling, and then we can hand them over to the next institution, hand them over to the bank, teach them how to communicate with the bank. So it's not just a solo project, it's collaboration is everything. And we like to think whether the bridge to make sure that these, there's collaborative efforts between um, institutions and between entrepreneurs and the ecosystem players and the enterprise support organizations. So I think we are getting very close to the end of our session, but I'd like to give you the choice to tell the audience either a top tip, if they can scale something up, one thing, because we were talking about choices, one thing to focus on, or you can tell them, what are you thinking about that keeps you up at night the most that you want to get over and how you're doing it? We're gonna start with Alan. <laughs> this time, switch it up. Thank you. So I think to the youth, for us, one thing I've noted is we, we just have to get things done. But the challenge that I've seen is we want to be perfect. And uh, perfect is the opposite of good, but good is good enough. So let's just do what we need to do, make mistakes, and learn along the way. We'll never start perfect. Thank you. Dare to make mistakes. For me, uh, I would like to suggest all eco-panels, you know, 
if you are really sure about your business just don't care about the people don't care about the competitors just do it if i did then you can do it too like nike yeah this would you have competitors and if for any product the market is so huge if any one player is going to you know uh, compete the market it's not going to fulfill you have you you definitely need competitors for that it's amazing to do a business um i would say fail fast and fail forward um there's no such thing as mistakes it's just all lessons so just take there's a takeaway in everything so if you fall flat on your face that's still great um what did you learn from it and how can you avoid that hurdle the next time and collaboration is everything collaborate as much as you can that um builds more value and get a really good mentors that helps you a lot that's true mentors partners collaborators network and do it that's and what fail. we're hearing fail is good failing is okay <laughs> perfect uh, with that we're going to end our session and as we end our session we have a quick message from the UN youth envoy and then we're going to be moving right into the next session which is the pitch session for the ecopreneurs so stay tuned and thank you for your attention